its grass blades are tall, they stand up vindictively straight and self-sufficient, and are unsociably wide apart, with uncommonly spots of barren sand between. One of the queerest things I know of is to hear tourists from the States go into ecstasies over the loveliness of ever-blooming California, and they always do go into that sort of ecstasies. But perhaps they would modify them if they knew how old Californians, with a memory full upon them of the dust-covered and questionable summer greens of Californian verdure, stand astonished and filled with worshipping admiration in the presence of the lavish richness, the brilliant green, the infinite freshness, the spendthrift variety of form and species and foliage that make an eastern landscape a vision of paradise itself. The idea of a man falling into raptures over grave and somber California, when that man has seen New England's meadow expanses, and her maples, oaks, and cathedral windowed elms decked in summer attire, or the opaline splendors of autumn descending upon her forests, comes very near being funny. Would be, in fact, but that it is so pathetic. No land with an unvarying climate can be very beautiful. The tropics are not, for all the sentiment that is vested on them, that is wasted on them, they seem beautiful at first, but sameness impars the charm by and by. Change is the handmaiden nature requires to do her miracles with. The land that has four well-defined seasons cannot lack beauty or pall with monotony. Each season brings a world of enjoyment and interest in the watching of its unfolding, its gradual harmonious development, its culminating graces, and just as one begins to tire of it, it passes away and a radical change comes with new witcheries and new glories in its train. And I think that to one in sympathy with nature, each season in its turn seems the loveliest. San Francisco, a truly fascinating city to live in, is stately and handsome at a fair distance. But close at hand, one notes that the architecture is mostly old-fashioned. Many streets are made up of decaying smoke-grimed. Wooden houses in the barren sand hills toward the outskirts obtrude themselves into prominently. Obtrude themselves too prominently. Even the kindly climate is sometimes pleasanter when read about than personally experienced. For a lovely cloudless day wears out its welcome by and by. And then when the, when the long for rain does come, it stays. Even the playful earthquake is better contemplated at a dis. However, there are varying opinions about that. The climate of San Francisco is mild and singularly equable. The thermometer stands at about 70 degrees the year round. It hardly changes at all. You sleep under one or two light blankets summer and winter, and never use a mosquito bar. Nobody ever wears summer clothing. You wear black broadcloth, if you have it, in August and January, just the same. It is no colder and no warmer in the one month than the other. You do use overcoats, and you do not use fans. It is as pleasant a climate as could well be contrived, take it all around, and it is doubtless the most unvarying in the whole world. The wind blows there a good deal in the summer months, but then you can go over to Oakland if you choose, three or four miles away. It does not blow there. It has only snowed twice in San Francisco in 19 years, and then it only remained on the ground long enough to astonish the children and set them to wondering what the feathery stuff was. During eight months of the year, straight along, the skies are bright and cloudless, and never a drop of rain falls. But when the other four months come along, you will need to go and steal an umbrella, because you will require it. Not just one day, but 120 days in hardly varying succession. When you want to go visiting or attend church or the theater, you never look up at the clouds to see whether it is likely to rain or not. 
you look at the almanac. If it is winter, it will rain. If it is summer, it won't rain. And you cannot help it. You never need a lightning rod because it never thunders and it never lightens. And after you have listened for six or eight weeks every night to the dismal monotony of those quiet rains, you will wish in your heart the thunder would leap and crash and roar along those drowsy skies once more, once, and make everything alive. You will wish the prisoned lightnings would cleave the dull firmament asunder and light it with a blinding glare for one little instant. You would give anything to hear the old familiar thunder again and see the lightning strike somebody. And along in the summer when you have suffered about four months of lustrous, pit pitiless sunshine, you are ready to go down on your knees and plead for rain, hail, snow, thunder, and lightning, anything to break the monotony. You will take an earthquake if you cannot do any better, and the chances are that you'll get it, too. San Francisco is built on sand hills, but they are prolific sand hills. They yield a generous vegetation. All the rare flowers which people in the States rear with such patient care in parlor flower pots and greenhouses flourish luxuriantly in the open air there all the year round. Calla lilies, all sorts of geraniums, passion flowers, moss roses. I do not know the names of a tenth part of them. I only know that while New Yorkers are burdened with banks and drifts of snow, Californians are burdened with banks and drifts of flowers, if they only keep their hands off and let them grow. And I have heard that they have also the rarest and most curious of all the flowers, the beautiful Espiritu Santo, as the Spaniards call it, or Flower of the Holy Spirit, though I thought it grew only in Central America down on the isthmus. In its cup is the daintiest little facsimile of a dove as pure as snow. The Spaniards have a superstitious reverence for it. The blossom has been conveyed to the States, submerged in ether, and the bulb has been taken thither also. But every attempt to make it bloom after it arrived has failed. I have elsewhere spoken of the endless winter of Mono, California, but for the, and but this moment of the eternal spring, and but this moment of the eternal spring of San Francisco. Now if we travel a hundred miles in a straight line, we come to the eternal summer of Sacramento. One never sees summer clothing or mosquitoes in San Francisco, but they can be found in Sacramento, not always and unvaryingly, but about 143 months out of 12 years, perhaps. Flowers bloom there, always, the reader can easily believe. People suffer and sweat and swear, morning, noon, and night, and wear out their staunchest energies fanning themselves. It gets hot there, but if you go down to Fort Yuma, you will find it hotter. Fort Yuma is probably the hottest place on earth. The thermometer stays at 120 in the shade there all the time, except when it varies and goes higher. It is a U.S. military post and its occupants get so used to the terrific heat they suffer without it. There is a tradition attributed to John Phoenix that has been purloined by fifty different scribblers who were too poor to invent a fancy but not ashamed to steal one, M.T. That a very, very wicked soldier died there once and of course went straight to the hottest corner of perdition and the next day he telegraphed back for his blankets. <laughs> there is no doubt about the truth of this statement. There can be no doubt about it. I have seen the place where the soldier used to board. In Sacramento it is fiery summer always, and you can gather roses and eat strawberries and ice cream, and wear white linen clothes and paint and perspire at eight or nine o'clock in the morning, and then take the cars and at nine put on your furs and your skates and go skimming over frozen Donner Lake, 7,000 feet above the valley, among snow banks 15 feet deep, and in the shadow of grand mountain peaks that lift their frosty crags 10,000 feet above the level of the sea. There is a transition for you, 
Where will you find another like it in the Western Hemisphere? And some of us have swept around snow-walled curves of the Pacific Railroad in that vicinity, 6,000 feet above the sea, and looked down as the birds do upon the deathless summer of the Sacramento Valley with its fruitful fields, its feathery foliage, its silver streams, all slumbering in the mellow haze of its enchanted atmosphere, and all infinitely softened and spiritualized by distance, a dreamy, exquisite glimpse of fairyland, made all the more charming and striking that it was cut through a forbidding gateway of ice and snow and savage crags and precipices.